And one of the most important sensory modalities, little understood, is the sense of touch. And what I'm going to go through in the next sort of 20, 25 minutes is research that uh, I've been doing and started actually in industry, interestingly enough. Um, I've just come out of 15 years uh, in R&D. I led a cognitive neuroscience group in industry. Uh, I was lucky enough to be able to fund that research group through Blue Sky funding, so I didn't actually have to work for any specific application. This was Unilever Research had that vision where they would throw money at people like me to sort of build the future. Now the reason I got into touch was obviously what I was doing had to bear some relevance to what this company made. I distilled Unilever's business down into providing the wherewithal for when I started 6.7 billion primates to either feed or groom. So they make things that you stick in your mouth and they make things you stick in your body. Grooming behavior is touch. And a lot of grooming behavior, if you look at primate behavior, is more about the social consequences of touch than it is about some functional consequence of cleaning. Primate colonies, as you probably know, are hierarchically organized through grooming. So this touch thing is more than just the physical, functional characteristics of touch. And that's where I come in from work that we've been doing that has identified a population or a system in the human skin of touch nerves, but not the touch nerves you think you've got. So they're not consciously registered. So I'll, I'll hopefully explain that. If you look at touch, you can see that this area spans a phenomenal array of different linkages from social psychology, cultural anthropology, the whole virtual reality. Simeon, the big problem with much virtual reality is it's easy to fool vision. It is easy to fool hearing. It is not easy. You cannot virtually touch someone because you actually physically need to activate mechanoreceptors. So there's a whole range of areas and what the one that I've been basically focusing on here at John Moores is the, is the neurosciences and my sort of uh, USP or overarching wild statement is that nurturing touch actually has some significant impact in the development of the social brain, i.e. all of you the way you are, is shaped to a large extent by very early interactions in utero and in those early weeks, days and months of life where nurturing behaviour is a specific input. If we just look at some examples from plucked from the literature, which is giving a clue that there's something else about touch which we may be missing. Just this point of handling, the a hand on the shoulder. Every medic, clinical person or psychologist knows that that, that reassuring touch is communicating something to the recipient which is way beyond what you may have thought intellectually is going on. Something else is being responsible to processing that kind of caring or affiliative touch. This one I particularly like from a, an American researcher. Basically an observational study looking at French teenagers in, a, in, in Paris and American teenagers and found that these French are all over each other, you know, it's all touchy, touchy. And yet, the American teenagers have far more aggression between the way they're touching each other. And you know, there's a book published recently by some American journalist about bringing up babies in France or Paris. I can't remember the name of it now, but it, it, it is, it had, she had a really quite a, a, a sexy title, didn't it? Is that the way that French mothers dealt with their infants was completely different to the way that American mothers dealt with their infants. You know, it was the French way of bringing up kids. And of course, there's a lot of touch involved. Um, this goes back actually to a classic experiment in the, in the late 50s, early 60s by a guy called Harry Harlow. He didn't know what I'm talking about today, by the way, that there are special systems of nerves in the skin that love to be stroked. But what Harry Harlow did is taking these infant monkeys away from their mother at birth they were given the option to, to basically feed from a wire surrogate 
that had a feeding nipple with food in it, or they could spend time with a surrogate mother that was just basically covered in soft fur, but no feeding. So there was no reward associated with staying with this surrogate. There was a reward associated with staying with this surrogate, i.e. food. And what they found was that the monkey spent actually most of its time, the bulk of its time, with this soft, cuddly mother rather than the one with food. Now, just to leap to the technique that we are developing in my lab here in Liverpool, but the one that I've been using with colleagues in Gothenburg, and it's the technique that allowed us to identify that in the skin there are a population of nerves that basically love to be stroked. And the technique that we use to do that is microneurography. And with microneurography, you take a bit like an acupuncture needle, that you pop it through the skin into an underlying nerve. And that nerve is like a telephone cable. So this is what a peripheral nerve looks like. It's like a it's like a big phone cable. Each of these little dots is like one line connected to one telephone. In this analogy, each of these is a neuron that connects to a receptor in the skin. So each of these is a single um, relay of information coming, let's say, from a touch receptor, a pain receptor, a temperature receptor. And this is the, uh, the process that comes out of just one neuron cell body. Anyway, what we do in microneurography, you pop one of these things through the skin into this nerve. This nerve is a bundle of what's called fascicles. We then get into a fascicle, and here's an electron micrograph of the tip of this electrode. And this is non-insulated. The rest of it is insulated, so it doesn't pick up any, any other noise. And basically, you record the activity that's coming up a single neuron. Uh, I think we're the only people that can do this in the UK. The, the technique was developed in Gothenburg. Uh, nobody still knows why and how it works, uh, because it is phenomenal. But this is the only sensory system that you can actually get into the, that process where the outside world is changed into the neural world. So every sensory system, vision, hearing, taste, all those physical and chemical stimuli, have to end up with signals that go down these things. And we'll hear those signals in a minute. Now, Diane's gone because she couldn't stand the noise. Uh, so basically, this is, this is the setup. We put an electrode into the nerve. We connect it to an amplifier. And this is touch, or taste, or smell. What a guy called Orca Valvo discovered 20, 25 years ago was that when he had one of these electrodes in the skin, and he was looking, at, in fact, for pain nerves, he found that there was a recording from a nerve that every time he touched the skin gently, there was a delay and then that nerve fired. So these nerves don't respond to the immediate contact of something on the skin, okay? So that's the touch that you all know about. If you touch yourself, you feel it immediately. You feel it immediately because that touch receptor is connected to nerves that transmit information really quickly. So they're called my myelinated nerves. These are the nerves, by the way, that, or these myelin is what damaged, what's damaged um, with uh, individuals with multiple sclerosis, by the way. So once that myelin goes, a nerve fiber can't send information that quickly. So all your touch nerves are connected to the touch part that processes touch in the brain by these myelinated nerves. So every time you touch yourself, whiz, that information is into your brain and you know that you've touched yourself. This is another set of touch nerves, which when you touch the skin, and that's what this shows here, we're pu pushing something into the skin, you don't get an immediate response. You get something coming in afterwards. Now, that can't serve any discriminative function, yeah? That delay in the brain responding or the nerve responding to that touch has to have another role. And this is where we come in with the interpretation that this delayed response is having an impact on the emotional consequences of that touch that you're not actually consciously aware of. And don't do this, but if you touch the person next to you, You'd feel their touch, but I guarantee something else is going to waft in afterwards, yeah? This affective side, this, this emotional side of touch. 
So we can measure these things. This little video here explains what I've just described to you. So we're recording from a touch nerve in the arm that feeds this bit of the skin. So the little receptors are here. And here we're recording from one of these pleasure fibers that I've just described. And what you'll see, every time the skin's touched, that's a nerve firing, yeah? That's touch. So we're recording from that nerve. Every time you touch the skin, it's sending that information to the brain immediately. Now we're doing the same thing with one of these slow touch nerve. And you can see there's nowhere near that immediate response. And look if you do it really slowly. These nerves love to be stroked at a particular velocity. And I'll come to that one in a minute. So we basically went away and built a robot that stroked you. So this took five years to develop. It's a highly sophisticated stroking machine. <laughs> it has a very sophisticated force controller and we can, know, we can control the velocity of, of stroking across the skin. The reason we built a robot is that exploring this system we knew we had to take the social noise out of it. Yeah, if someone else is doing the touching, this brain is, you know, if it's a female you're going to be responding, if it's a, if it's a male, so we, we, we had to do it with a robot. This may get a bit sort of, this is, so we're recording from one of these um, slow nerve fibres. We're stroking the skin slowly, 0.1 centimetres per second, right out to very quickly, 30 centimetres per second. So we're randomly stroking across the skin, we're recording from one of these things, and those brrrps that you heard just now, we're counting them. And what we found was actually quite fascinating, is that this nerve is most excited by stroking velocities that are around about three to five centimeters per second. Exactly the velocities that you would stroke a lover with or cuddle a baby, yeah? So you wouldn't be doing that, and you wouldn't be doing that. These nerves are tuned to the behavior that we see when a mother cuddles a baby or a father cuddles a baby. If we do a bit of psychophysics now, where we can not, we're not recording from the nerve, we're stroking people across the skin at different velocities and we're asking them to rate on a visual analog scale how pleasant or unpleasant that stimulus was and what do we find? Exactly the same function. Around about three centimeters per second, if I'm stroking your skin, you'll say that's far more pleasant than if I do it quicker or slower. And that, I won't go into all this data, helped us develop what we call, these are called C-tactile afferents. That's the C-tactile pleasant touch hypothesis. That should have come out, we won't worry about that. <clears throat> so we've approached understanding this system using micronography, using psychophysics, i.e. asking people to respond to the controlled stimulus, and we've done stuff with newer imaging. Let me just show you the, um, the rotary tactile stimulator, as we call it, in action. Um, this looks like a bit of a joke machine, but I say it must have cost a couple of hundred thousand pounds to develop this over five years. These are different textured surfaces, so rough, smooth, etc. And what we're building up with this kind of psychophysical experiment is that when you stroke people on different body parts, let's say at the preferred velocity, which we know is about five centimeters per second, people don't report that that pleasantness of that touch is the same on every body part. So there are certain parts of the body, we, we, we steer away from the genitals so far. So we're looking at all those skin parts that, that you would get access to if you were grooming, is that some parts of the body are far nicer to stroke than others. So there's a heterogeneity in the way that the body responds to pleasant touch. The other key thing that I should mention is that we've never found these nerve fibers in the palms of the hand or the soles of the feet. This is called glabrous skin. And if we go back to the, in evolutionary sort of time, these were, would be on the floor. Yeah? These are um, 
body parts that we use for manipulating objects, handling things. You wouldn't want this kind of affective system here. Although you can feel pleasant things with the palm of your hand, don't? so that's a secondary thing. So they're never found here. Um, <clears throat> but basically, it, uh, if you want to get dig into this more, because I know it's, it's, it's coming at you with uh, a rather a lot of information. But we basically are describing a system of touch which is outside that which most people would be aware of. So two systems for touch. One of which is the touch you all know about, the one that is coded for by these fast conducting axons that take information to the brain immediately. And then this C fiber system. These are the same class of nerves, by the way, that will give you a toothache. So if you're in real pain, it's these nerve fibers that basically <coughs> plug into the emotional part of the brain. So you can see where C fibers don't give you information about discrimination, what an object is. They feed into emotional brain that give you that sort of horrible, you know, mental state you get with pain. But also we know that these nerve fibers plug in the pleasure nerve fibers also go to emotional parts of the brain. So we've got these two routes that we're working on to enable us to um, understand this system. Just a couple of slides to, <coughs> to give a link to some of the research projects that we've been doing. This may be an evolutionary conserved mechanism or there may be absolutely no link between what I'm showing you here or not. But there's piece of work that was done by scientists at Cambridge and Oxford, funded actually by the Leverhulme Trust, um, that I've and my colleague have recently received a grant to pursue this work. You take the solitary locust and you stroke its thorax with a soft brush. You have to do this for about an hour or two, by the way, but the, this is an insect, they're not as smart as us. That changes in to the gregarious locust. So the solitary grasshopper can metamorphosize into the gregarious locust by touch. And the neurotransmitter or the chemical that actually is important for that transmission is serotonin. Now serotonin is the neurotransmitter in the brain that all the big drug companies are after. Yeah? These are the mood altering yeah, all your Prozacs, all your citalopram's, all your antidepressants are targeting serotonin. And there's a link between lower levels of serotonin and lowered mood and, and depressive states. Now I noticed that people who take ecstasy, which is a chemical that basically floods the brain with serotonin, so it ups your serotonin levels, and more serotonin makes you feel really good, one of the key effects of ecstasy is that touch now becomes absolutely phenomenal. In fact, when this drug first came, I won't say on the market, but when it first started to be used, it was actually called an entactogenic drug because kids on ecstasy really got off on touch. Now, brains are quite smart. They kind of drive you into behaviours that you may not be really aware of why you're there. But one of the consequences of some lonely little teenager popping his ecstasy in, in his little lonely flat is the rave, yeah? Now, the rave is your gregarious locust. What's happening with the rave is you're getting a lot of touch. You're getting a lot of squeezy, contacty social interactions. So, this is our link between touch, ecstasy, the locust, and uh, pleasure. So that basically just relates what I've said about this research that was done on locusts, whether this is a, a mechanism that's conserved in humans. Uh, I have to say all the, the networks that I've worked with over the years that have provided the ability to sort of pull this convergent scientific approaches together that are, that are being built here are these guys in Sweden, Nottingham and North Carolina. Uh, that paper ended up the first one that really defined that inverted U function um, within a nature neuroscience paper. Um, and also I managed to get into the daily sport. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this, this is impact at a realistic level. I sort of don't give a, I mean the scientists we have to communicate across the board. So these rather, you know, the best place as a scientist to publish anything is in nature. But 
Yeah, and the Danish sport were quite good actually. They they got the handle on on this thing. Cut, yeah, and also it makes sense to do things that, that sell. Yeah, you know, I did. I've done a lot of work on itch. Um, in fact, I got awarded the Ig Nobel Prize for itch. I don't know whether you've heard of the Ig Nobel, but the colleague that I was doing it with was a clinical dermatologist in the United States, and he refused it on our behalf because he, and he's an idiot. He thought the Ig Nobel Prize would trivialise his role as a dermatologist because itch is a terrifyingly debilitating condition. Yeah, chronic itch is horrible. We may get it this year because he, I'm trying to change his mind that it's. You know, people in chronic itch need the sympathy and understanding. It is a terrifying condition, probably worse than chronic pain. If you've known anybody that's got urticaria or something, you know, they, they will scratch themselves to pieces. Uh, sometimes they get with pregnancy, actually. <laughs> so it's, it can be awful. Um, I, don't, I, I should stop here, actually. I've got a little video from Nature, but that, that'll do for the moment. So we are, yeah, the social brain. You're right on there, Simeon, with, with what's happening with the digital revolution. It's taking the human out of the equation and there will be costs and consequences to that, really. Anyway, thank you very much. Francis, that, that, was, that was really interesting. I mean, you actually answered a couple of questions I've been mining up right at the moment, <laughs> right. the serotonin ones. But it's obviously the case that, you know, we're not the only animals that respond to that level of touch, either. I mean, I'm not talking about the locusts, but certainly any of us who have pets. Yeah. You know, they will sit there and they will just be. And it's funny, it is at that, there's a standard rate we do it at. Yeah. I mean, I hadn't thought of that until you. Yeah. So you mentioned it, whether it was a These nerves were actually first, they, they, they've been known to be in all furry mammals, but they, they, they were thought to be absent in primates and humans because we couldn't find them. Therefore, they were thought to be just a vestigial, you know, they were no longer of any importance. Uh, it's his microneurography technique that found them, and you had to explain, well, why do we have a touch system that's so slow? Um, but that touch stuff, there's some very interesting work being done with rodent pups. <coughs> Most, the, the, the initial behaviour when a pup is born from, from a rat is that the mother will lick it, yeah? Now that's touch. If you take those pups away from that mother so that they never get licked, but they get fed, watered and all the other things that they need to keep alive, there is a significant effect in their stress, stress responses, their behaviour, their aggression, their promiscuity even, yeah? So the only thing they're missing is their early interaction between the mother touching and that brain develops a completely different social framework. And that's purely, in this case, through a uh, lack of interactive touch. So there's an interesting, you know, the biological importance of this bonding is so fundamental to the social brain's development. Um, Just one quick follow-up, I'm, I'm conscious that Sue, as chair of the Research Ethics Committee, is here, so we'll just pretend she's not for a minute. Um, in terms I've long come to issues. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Have you, have you or any other group done some microneurography on people who have taken ecstasy? We just to try to repeat the same sort of things to try and yep. see if there's an extended period of the simulation or an enhanced period. We know that people that have taken ecstasy have a much heightened response to pain. And if you remember, pain is C-fibres again. There are consequences to these drugs which may, which may not be aware. They're not totally debilitating, but that is something that we would dearly love to do. There's also people at the Pain Research Institute in Liverpool want to do some work with us on people with diabetic neuropathy, chronic neuropathic pain. Again, we can get into these systems and find out what's going on at the early, because this is where the information comes into the brain. The one group I do want to do this with, I, and this is just a final comment, is that I have a theory that a um, lack of developmental integrity in this system may be responsible for what we see with autism. Most autistic children hate to be touched. Uh, now, I've spoken to Temple Grandin, who's sort of America's most famous autist. If you've not seen her film and you're interested in autism, you should see it. But she said herself that she hated, hated touch. And what these idiot psychiatrists were doing in the 50s and 60s was blaming the parent for the child's behaviour problems because they weren't stroking and they weren't cuddling her. Yeah? These kids hate being stroked and cuddled. That looks like it could be a problem with the development of C-tactile If they're not stimulated, the social brain does not develop. 
and you get all these consequences of autism where you're locked in and you don't have this ability to understand other because self and other haven't been translated. And it can only be done through touch, yeah? That brain needs to know what's out there. It can only do it through physical contact um, and smell. So the autists, but I have to say, just for, you know, on the ethics side, that, that, it, that it, I was very impressed with the way that the ethical committee you know, allowed us to do this technique. I mean, it, it, it wasn't simple, but it, it's, a, it's a sign of their integrity, I think, that they could take on things like this and provide us with ethical clearance to do them. They usually try and find a way to make things Yeah, no, it's great to get that support. That's really great.